I developed uh, a series of courses on what I've called rejected knowledge, because this seems a way of describing it in the university catalogue, so it's just not quite so frightening. Um, I, I got, in, got my foot in the door in a surreptitious way by teaching it first uh, as a freshman course. So I offered a course for freshmen on rejected knowledge, which was meant to be about all the things that the academy doesn't want to think about. My university has a core program in which students have to take four required courses. The first course is in the roots of Western civilization. I sometimes teach that. And fourth, they have a course which is called Scientific Perspectives, which is meant to teach them how science works. And in the rubrics of this course, it says it shows the possibilities and the limitations of the scientific method. And it's mostly taught by my scientific colleagues. Well, I decided I wanted to teach rejected knowledge as a scientific perspectives course, because it seems to me that uh, this is a very important element in the scientific approach to the world. And actually, the methods that I wanted to introduce the students to were, to my mind, the essence of the truly scientific method, which is that of having an open mind. And so I designed this course. I, I, found that I, I decided I couldn't teach UFOs and that stuff. That wouldn't wash for my colleagues. That was, that was too weird. But that I could construct a course that was based on the Atlantis debate. I called it the Atlantis debate. This being a catchword for the broader question of whether there were once high civilizations on Earth before the historically known ones. And with some difficulty, I managed to get my colleagues to approve this course as the student's introduction to the scientific method and its limitations. I started the students off with two books, side by side, L. Sprague du Camp's uh, book on Atlantis, which is a thoroughly skeptical, thoroughly 1940s account of how Atlantis couldn't possibly have existed in the middle of the middle Atlantic Ocean, <coughs> written in a very snide, very, a very um, psychop uh, style. Side by side with that, they read Colin Wilson's From Atlantis to the Sphinx. And this was a surefire success. They read the two books side by side, chapter by chapter, and I arranged them so that they addressed the same subjects more or less each, each uh, session. And they began to get a picture of, of this crusty old skeptic and this warm-hearted Englishman. <laughs> In the Middle Ages, there were seven liberal arts. <clears throat> they were four, three of them had to do with language, uh, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And four of them had to do with mathematics. And after you had completed the course of these seven liberal arts, you were ready to study the queen of the arts, or the queen of the sciences, which was theology. No getting away from it. The students have a fundamental belief. It doesn't matter if they're Jews, Catholics, Protestants, atheists, agnostics. Their fundamental belief, once you drive them to the wall, is in the reality of what science is doing. And this is why they submit to the tyranny of the hard sciences. Just as in the Middle Ages, you drive somebody to the wall, they really believe in Jesus Christ. They really believe in the, in the inspiration of the Bible. Theology becomes the groundwork, unquestioned, and the rest of uh, knowledge can be discussed, but there, there's a dogmatic basis there. And I find myself in teaching rejected knowledge constantly coming up against this unspoken dogma that science is really where it's at. I try to teach them how to ask themselves two questions when they're reading these books. The first question is, what is the author trying to put over on me? Is he or she honest, qualified? Does he have an agenda? Is the agenda patent or latent? Does he care if I follow him or not? Uh, what's, what's his motive in writing the book? Was it to make money? Was it because he got involved in the subject? All these questions. First of all, what, what, what is the author putting over? And second, which is the more important one still, what, are, what is this doing to me? I try to get them to observe their own reactions as they read these things and as they meet these ideas. How am I reacting to these? With skepticism? With eager belief? Or with what I try to encourage, which is, uh, of course, a Fortean attitude, a kind of agnostic suspicion that there might be something to it, but the, court, the, the jury is still out. Resistance from the psychops themselves in teaching such a course. Are they really ignoring you? 
They made me rewrite the course a few times before they approved it, but you know, I've been at the university a long time, and um, I've written a lot of books, and that's, that seems to be enough to then, uh, let one do more or less what one wants. I'm very fortunate to be able to do it. I couldn't do it in a place like Harvard. Uh, could never get away with it. But the, the, the Cyclops, we had James Randi come recently. They brought him, I think, uh, partly to counter the effect of my course. They brought him to talk to the students. And he gave the most amusing, but the most bigoted possible talk. And uh, I've never seen such an example of a closed, a closed-minded fundamentalist as James Randi. James Randi and charming, like some of them often are. But it was, it was clear that he, he he has an absolutely firm, touchingly firm foundation of belief, and that nothing, but nothing, was going to shake him from it.